Hello, I'm Professor Sims, and in this video, I will discuss evolutionary processes. This is the eighth in the series of 10 lessons held as part of my Gym Bio 1 course. If you're a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include describing the theory of evolution and its misconceptions. We'll explain adaptation and convergent versus divergent evolution. We'll define species and we'll talk about how species are identified. We'll discuss several aspects of adaptation and speciation. We'll define population genetics and talk about how scientists use population genetics to study population evolution. We will also discuss the Hardy-Weinberg principle and its importance, and the types of variation and how natural selection works in many ways to shape populations. In the mid-19th century, Darwin and Wallace independently described the mechanism of evolution. Both naturalists conducted extensive exploration with Darwin's voyage on the HMS Beagle and Wallace's expeditions in the Amazon and the Malay Archipelago. Darwin observed distinct yet similar species on the Galapagos Islands, particularly noticing the variation in finch beak shapes related to food acquisition. Darwin termed this mechanism natural selection which involves the more successful reproduction of individuals with favorable traits that enable them to survive environmental changes, and this leads to evolutionary change. For instance, Darwin observed that giant tortoises in the Galapagos had longer necks compared to those on other islands with drier lowlands. The tortoises with longer necks had a selective advantage because they could reach more leaves and access more food. During times of drought, this gave them a better chance of survival and reproduction compared to tortoises with shorter necks, and over time, the long-necked trait became prevalent in the population. According to Darwin, natural selection arises from three principles in nature. Firstly, characteristics are inherited from parents to offspring. Second, more offspring are produced than can survive due to limited resources, leading to competition for survival and reproduction. Finally, offspring exhibit variations in their characteristics, and those with inherited traits that enhance their competitive abilities have a higher likelihood of surviving and reproducing. And these advantages become more common in subsequent generations, resulting in population changes over time, a process known as descent with modification. Natural selection is the sole mechanism known for adaptive evolution, driving greater adaptation of populations to their environments. Let's watch a video here that talks more about Darwin and natural selection. Charles Darwin developed his theories after his adventures upon the HMS Beagle. In his travels, he observed that creatures found on the islands he visited were similar to ones found on the mainland, but appeared to be slightly different. It wasn't until he returned home that he came to the conclusion that species are specially modified to their environments, and that's why they differ. He developed four conditions explaining why this happens. Darwin's theory of natural selection by descent with modification is testable and observable fact. Experiments have been conducted in the wild and in labs. Let's dive deeper into Darwin's four conditions. Condition number one, individuals within a population differ. There are features that differ within populations of the same animal. In our case, the feature that varies between our giraffes is neck length. Some giraffes were born with long necks, some were born with short necks. Condition number two, the differences are, at least in part, passed from parents to offspring. Darwin's descent with modification is the idea that offspring are fairly similar to their parents with some genetic differences. Condition number three, some individuals are more successful at surviving and reproducing than others. In the case of our giraffes, the long neck individual did not acquire its neck by stretching to grab the leaves. Instead, individuals within the population were born with a neck length that was longer than others. Because a longer neck allowed them to reach the food that was otherwise unattainable, it gave them an advantage. Condition number four. The successful individuals succeed because of variant traits they have inherited and will pass on to their offspring. <coughs> Giraffes with the longer neck advantage are in better health and able to pass this feature to their offspring. Because this trait is more successful than shorter necks, more individuals in the population have it. Over time, this process can result in populations that specialize for particular environments and may eventually result in emergence of new species. 
In other words, natural selection is an important process, though not the only process, by which evolution takes place within a population of organisms. Darwin observed that the beak shape in finches was different based on what the finches ate. He postulated that the ancestral species beak had adapted over time to equip the finches to acquire different types of food. And Darwin wasn't the only scientist that studied the Galapagos finches. Peter and Rosemary Grant observed changes in beak shape distribution among the medium ground finch population in the Galapagos island of Daphne Major across generations. So this was during a period of increased rainfall versus uh, 1978 up through 1987. So during a period of increased rainfall caused by, by El Nino, large hard seeds became harder to find, favoring the survival and reproduction of the small-billed birds that could only feed on the abundant small softer seeds. And as a result, the average bill size decreased in subsequent generations. And then when conditions returned to normal, the trends towards smaller bills ceased as larger seeds became available. Natural selection relies on genetic variation within a population, which primarily arises from mutation and sexual reproduction. Mutations introduce new alleles and their effects on fitness can range from harmful to beneficial or it can even be neutral. Sexual reproduction contributes to genetic diversity by producing unique combinations of alleles in offspring. And adaptation is a heritable trait that enhances an organism's survival and reproduction in its current environment. Populations are considered to be adapting when genetic variations occur over time, leading to increased or maintained fitness in the population within its environment. Examples include a platypus's webbed feet for swimming, a snow leopard's thick fur for cold environments, and a cheetah's speed for catching prey. The favorability of traits depends on the prevailing environmental conditions as natural selection responds to changes. For instance, a plant species with large leaves may be selected in a moist climate for increased energy absorption. However, if the climate shifts and water becomes limited, plants with small leaves that conserve water may be favored. Evolution gives rise to extensive diversity in form and function among species. Divergent evolution occurs when two species evolve in different directions from a common ancestor. This can be observed in the distinct forms of reproductive organs in flowering plants, shaped by selection in diverse, diverse physical environments and adaptation to various pollinators. Similar traits can evolve independently in distantly related species through convergent evolution. For instance, both bats and insects have evolved flight and possess structures called wings, which are adaptations for flight. However, bat and insect wings originated from different original structures. This phenomenon, known as convergent evolution, occurs when similar traits emerge separately in species without recent common ancestry. Ancestry. Although these traits have similar structures and functions, such as flying, they evolved completely independently. There is substantial and compelling evidence for evolution across various levels of biological organization. Fossils, for example, provide evidence of organisms that differ from those found today and reveal gradual evolutionary changes over time. By dating and categorizing fossils from around the world, scientists can establish the chronological order of organisms and observe the evolution of forms over millions of years. Homology structures demonstrate common ancestry as they have similar anatomical features in different species. Vestigial structures, such as your appendix or your tonsils, are remnants of ancestral traits with no current function, reflecting evolutionary change. Biogeography shows how species geographic distribution is influenced by historical connections. Molecular biology reveals shared DNA sequences, indicating genetic relationships and evolutionary connections. Together, these lines of evidence support the theory of evolution. Figure 18.7 is showing homologous structures. Uh, we have detailed records of human and horse evolution, as well as the similarities in anatomical structures like whale flippers. All of this further supports the evidence for evolution. The convergence of form in organisms living in similar environments provides evidence of evolution. Species like the Arctic fox and the ptarmigan have developed white phenotypes during winter to blend with the snow and ice, even though they're totally unrelated. Biogeography showcases how the distribution of organisms aligns with tectonic plate movements over time, with groups evolving uniquely in specific regions. Molecular biology further supports descent with modification as DNA sequence demonstrates 
demonstrates the relatedness of organisms and the evolution of new functions through gene duplication. When Darwin first introduced the theory of evolution, it stirred up some controversy. However, within 20 years of publishing his book on the origin of species, most biologists, especially the younger ones, embraced the theory. Despite its wide acceptance, misconceptions about how evolution works still persist. One misunderstanding is dismissing evolution as just a theory. In science, a theory is a well-tested explanation based on evidence. Evolution is supported by solid evidence like gravity and atom theories. Another misconception is thinking individuals evolve during their lifetime. Evolution occurs at the population level over generations, with traits changing in average, not in individuals. Evolution doesn't explain life's origin. Um, it describes how species change and diversify over time. Life's origins are still being studied. Evolution isn't purposeful. It doesn't strive for improvement. Traits exist in populations, and advantageous ones increase through natural selection based on environmental changes. Furthermore, humans did not evolve from apes. The branching point where humans and apes, including chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans, diverged from each other in the phylogenetic tree of life uh, an estimated six to seven million years ago. Myths and misconceptions about evolution. Let's talk about evolution. You've probably heard that some people consider it controversial, even though most scientists don't. But even if you aren't one of those people, and you think you have a pretty good understanding of evolution, chances are you still believe some things about it that aren't entirely right. Things like, Evolution is organisms adapting to their environment. This was an earlier, now discredited theory of evolution. Almost 60 years before Darwin published his book, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck proposed that creatures evolve by developing certain traits over their lifetimes and then passing those on to their offspring. For example, he thought that because giraffes spent their lives stretching to reach leaves on higher branches, their children would be born with longer necks. But we know now that's not how genetic inheritance works. In fact, individual organisms don't evolve at all. Instead, random genetic mutations cause some giraffes to be born with longer necks and that gives them a better chance to survive than the ones who weren't so lucky. Which brings us to survival of the fittest. This makes it sound like evolution always favors the biggest, strongest, or fastest creatures, which is not really the case. For one thing, evolutionary fitness is just a matter of how well-suited they are to their current environment. If all the tall trees suddenly died out and only short grass was left, all those long-necked giraffes would be at a disadvantage. Secondly, survival is not how evolution occurs. Reproduction is. And the world is full of creatures like the male anglerfish, which is so small and ill-suited for survival at birth that it has to quickly find a mate before it dies. But at least we can say that if an organism dies without reproducing, it's evolutionarily useless, right? Wrong. Remember, Natural selection happens not at the organism level, but at the genetic level. And the same gene that exists in one organism will also exist in its relatives. So a gene that makes an animal altruistically sacrifice itself to help the survival and future reproduction of its siblings or cousins can become more widespread than one that is solely concerned with self-preservation. Anything that lets more copies of the gene pass on to the next generation will serve its purpose. Except... Evolutionary purpose. One of the most difficult things to keep in mind about evolution is that when we say things like genes want to make more copies of themselves or even natural selection, we're actually using metaphors. A gene doesn't want anything and there's no outside mechanism that selects which genes are best to preserve. All that happens is that random genetic mutations cause the organisms carrying them to behave or develop in different ways. Some of those ways result in more copies of the mutated gene being passed on, and so forth. Nor is there any predetermined plan progressing towards an ideal form. It's not ideal for the human eye to have a blind spot where the optic nerve exits the retina, but that's how it developed, starting from a simple photoreceptor cell. In retrospect, it would have been much more advantageous for humans to crave nutrients and vitamins rather than just calories. But over the millennia, during which our ancestors evolved, 
calories were scarce, and there was nothing to anticipate that this would later change so quickly. So, evolution proceeds blindly, step by step by step, creating all of the diversity we see in the natural world. Although all life on Earth shares genetic similarities, only certain organisms engage in sexual reproduction and produce offspring capable of successful reproduction. And these organisms are referred to as members of the same biological species. A species is defined as a group of individual organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile, viable offspring. In nature, when individuals from different species cannot produce fertile offspring through mating, they are considered different species. Members of the same species share both external and internal characteristics that develop from their DNA. The more closely related two organisms are, the more DNA they have in common, much like how people share DNA with their immediate family members. Organisms within the same species have a high degree of DNA alignment, leading to shared characteristics and behaviors that contribute to successful reproduction. Populations of species share a gene pool, which encompasses all the gene variants within the species. Genetic variations within a species can only be passed on to the next generation through two primary pathways, asexual reproduction or sexual reproduction. In asexual reproduction, if the reproducing cell possesses the altered trait, the change is transmitted to the next generation. However, however for the changed trait to pass on through sexual reproduction, a gamete must possess the altered trait. In other words, sexually reproduce, reproducing organisms can undergo genetic changes in their body cells, but if these changes do not occur in a gamete, the altered trait will not be inherited by the next generation. Only heritable traits have the potential to evolve. Therefore, reproduction plays a crucial ro role in facilitating genetic changes within populations or species. In essence, organisms must be able to reproduce with each other to pass new traits onto their offspring. Speciation refers to the formation of two species from a single original species. While some species may produce hybrid offspring in general, species are defined as groups of individuals capable of interbreeding. The presence of hybrids suggests that these species may have descended from a common ancestor, and the speciation process may not yet be complete. To achieve speciation, two new populations must arise from a single population and evolve in a way that prevents interbreeding between them. Biologists propose two main mechanisms for this, allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Allopatric speciation involves the geographic separation of populations and subsequent evolution. Sympatric speciation occurs within a single population that remains in the same location. Dispersal involves a few individuals of a species moving to a new ge geographic area, while vicarious vicariance occurs when natural circumstances physically divide organisms. Numerous examples of allopatric speciation have been observed. For instance, along the west coast of the United States, we have distinct subspecies of spotted owls with genetic and phenotypic differences between the northern spotted owl and the Mexican spotted owl. The scientists discovered that the greater the distance between two once same species, the higher the likelihood of speciation. And this makes sense because as distance increases, environmental factors become less similar. So again, the example of the two owl populations, the northern population experiences cooler climates compared to the southern population. And the ecosystem's behaviors, hunting habits, and prey choices differ between the two populations, and these variations can lead to evolved differences and ultimately speciation. In certain cases, a single species disperses across an area and adapts to distinct niches or niches, um, which is just a fancy word for isolated habitats. And this can result in multiple speciation events originating from one common ancestor known as adaptive radiation. Islands like the Hawaiian Islands um, provide ideal conditions for adaptive of radiation due to their geographic isolation. Um, so the Hawaiian honey creeper is an example of adaptive radiation, as are Darwin's finches. Even without physical barriers, speciation can occur within the same habitat, a process called sympatric speciation. This divergence can be initiated by chromosomal er 
errors during cell division, leading to polyploidy where cells have extra sets of chromosomes. Over time, genetic and phenotypic differences between populations can lead to reproductive isolation, where mating becomes less likely. And if it does happen, the offspring may be non-viable or infertile. There are prezygotic and postzygotic barriers to reproductive isolation. Um, prezygotic barriers prevent reproduction from occurring at all, um, such as differences in breeding schedules, like temporal isolation breeding schedules are different. And then even if fertilization occurs, postzygotic barriers years can prevent successful reproduction from happening. happening. Um, hybrid offspring may not develop properly in the womb and they don't survive past the embryonic stage or they're not viable. Um, in other cases, hybrids are born, but then they're sterile, so they can't produce their own offspring. Figure 1817 is given an example of temporal isolation. So you've got two closely related frog species, but because they reproduce and like they mate at different times of the year, they are reproductively isolated from each other. Another type of isolation occurs when specific behaviors prevent reproduction. For example, male fireflies use unique light patterns to attract females, but different species have different patterns. So if a male tries to court a female from another species, she won't recognize the pattern and she won't be interested. There's other barriers before fertilization can happen, like sometimes the gametes of closely related organisms aren't compatible, like two puzzle pieces that just won't fit. And then figure 1819 is giving an example of damselfly males that have different shaped reproductive organs. So if a male tries to mate with a female from another species, it's going to be a mismatch and it's not going to work. Habitats can also influence speciation in ways other than polyploidy. Let's take a fish species living in a lake as an example. If the population grows and competition for food increases, some fish may discover a new food source at a dip different depth of the lake. And over time, these fish will interact more with each other and they'll breed together. And their offspring would continue this pattern, staying separate from their original population. And if they remained isolated long enough, simpra sympatric speciation can occur as they accumulate more genetic differences. These scenarios of reproductive isolation are found in nature, like in Lake Victoria, Victoria Africa, where conchilid fish have undergone hundreds of sympatric speciation events. And it's, it's fascinating to see how these fish living in the same area developed different traits and now they are in the process of speciation. And speciation is a process that takes place over a long period of time. And when a new species emerges, there's a transition phase where it interacts closely with related species. Sometimes after speciation, the two species can reconnect and interact, and individual organisms will mate with the nearby individuals that they can breed with. When two closely related species continue to interact and produce hybrid offspring, we call it a hybrid zone. And the zone can change over time depending on the fitness of the hybrids and the reproductive barrier that exists. If the hybrids are less fit than their parents, it reinforces speciation, pushing the species further apart and until they can no longer produce viable offspring. If reproductive barriers weaken, fusion occurs and the two species become one. If the hybrids are as fit as or fitter than their parents, the two species may fuse back into one. In some cases, two species may remain separate but still interact to produce individuals, creating a stable situation where no significant change occurs. Hybrids can vary in their fitness compared to their parents. Usually hybrids are less fit, leading to reduced reproduction over time and further divergence between species. And again, this is called reinforced reinforcement. Scientists use the term reinforcement because the low success of hybrids reinforces the original speciation process. But if hybrids are as fit or more fit than their parents, then the two species might fuse back into one. And scientists have observed cases where two species remain separate but continue to interact. And this is the stability since there's no substantial net change that's taking place. And when it comes to speciation rates, scientists study living organisms and fossils and they develop models to explain the different patterns. Their gradual speciation model suggests that species diverge slowly over time and in small steps. On the other hand, the punctuated equilibrium model proposes that a new species undergoes rapid changes from the parent species and then remains largely unchanged for ex extended periods. This early change 
model is called punctuated equilibrium because it starts with a sudden change and then it reaches a balance. It's important to note that punctuated equilibrium doesn't exclude gradualism. It simply suggests a faster pace at certain times. Population genetics is a branch of biology that studies the genetic composition and variation within populations of organisms. It focuses on understanding how genes and alleles are distributed and how they change over time within a population. Population genetics aims to explain the patterns and mechanisms of genetic changes in populations and how these changes can lead to evolution. Population genetics plays a significant role in understanding natural selection, the driving force behind evolution. Natural selection favors advantageous alleles that enhance an organism's fitness for survival and reproduction, leading to an increase in their allele frequency in the population. Population genetics also investigates genetic drift, which is a random process that can cause allele frequencies to change, especially in small populations. Genetic drift can lead to random fluctuations in allele frequencies and is more pronounced in smaller populations. Um, over time, genetic drift can result in evolutionary changes. Uh, as in gene flow, gene flow is the movement of alleles between populations through migration and interbreeding. Gene flow can introduce new genetic variation into a population or can interact the effects of genetic drift, thereby influencing the evolutionary trajectory of populations. Mutations are the ultimate source of genetic diversity, and they contribute to the pool of potential alleles available for natural selection to act upon. Finally, population genetics studies how population structure and geographic barriers can affect gene flow and lead to the emergence of new species. The Hardy-Weinberg principle, also known as the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or the Hardy-Weinberg law, is a fundamental concept in population genetics. Uh, it describes the relationship between the allele and genotype frequencies in a population under certain idealized conditions. The principle provides a null model against which real-world populations can be compared in order to detect evolutionary changes and understand factors influencing genetic variation. Essentially, if a population is in Hardy-Weinberg principle, what that means is that nothing is changing. Natural selection is not acting upon that population. It's in fact in equilibrium as far as its population genetics are concerned. The Hardy-Weinberg principle is based on several key assumptions. First is large population size. The, the population has to be large enough that random sampling errors do not significantly affect the allele frequencies. The next one is no mutation. There should be any new mutations introducing new alleles into the population. No migration, no immigration or immigration is influencing the gene pool. Random mating, so it's assuming that mating within the population occurs randomly with respect to genotype, meaning individuals do not preferentially choose mates based on their genotype. And then there's an assumption of no natural selection, so no advantage or disadvantage is associated with specific genotypes in terms of survival and reproductive success. So if something, if a population is in Hardy-Weinberg principle, all of these things are true if they are in equilibrium. So under these assumptions, the Hardy-Weinberg principle states that the allele and genotype frequencies within a population will remain constant from generation to generation. It describes the mathematical relationship between the frequencies of two alleles, let's call them A, big A, little a, and the frequency of three possible genotypes, big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a, in a population is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. Also, P plus Q equals 1. So P represents the frequency of the big A allele, Q is the frequency of the little a allele, P squared is the frequency of the big A, big A genotype, and Q squared is the frequency of the little a, little a genotype. Uh, let's watch this example of how to calculate allele frequencies and genotype frequencies using the Hardy-Weinberg equations. All frogs in this population will be either big G, big G, big G, little g, or little g, little g. There is also an allele frequency in our population. We're going to say here that 60%, a frequency of 0.6, of the alleles are big G. 40%, or a frequency of 0.4, of the alleles are little g. Notice the percentages add up to 100%, and the frequencies add up to 1. Now, to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we have to have five assumptions. Number one, no selection. No natural selection is acting upon these frogs. That means neither dark green nor light green will have any impact on reproductive fitness. Number two, no mutation. 
Baby frogs inherit genes from their parents and there are never mutations. Number three, no migration. Frogs can't come in, frogs can't go out. Number four, large population. There are a lot of frogs. Number five, random mating. The frogs mate without any specific choice. All of these five assumptions must be kept in order for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to happen. So in real life, does this generally happen? No. For example, in real life, maybe in a certain environment, predators can more easily see the light green frog. So perhaps they are eaten more and have less reproductive fitness. So if Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is unrealistic in nature, why does the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium matter? That's where the math comes in. The Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium gives you this baseline to compare how an evolving population could compare to one that remains constant without evolutionary forces acting upon it. And now let's explore the math. So there are two equations in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium that we'll focus on. We're going to start with the first one, P plus Q equals 1. In this equation, P is the dominant allele frequency in the population, and Q is the recessive allele frequency in the population. By the way, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium doesn't mean that P has to equal Q, and the dominant allele frequency in any population doesn't have to be larger than the recessive allele frequency in a population. That's a misconception because dominant alleles aren't always the more common allele. The equation does say that the dominant allele frequency and the recessive allele frequency have to equal 1. So in my example here, if I say 60% of the alleles are big G, 40% of the alleles are little g, 0.6 is P and 0.4 is Q. So this equation P plus Q equals 1 is for those allele frequencies. But what if I wanted to know the genotype frequencies? Meaning I wanted to know the frequency of frogs that are homozygous dominant, which is big G, big G, heterozygous, which is big G, little g, or homozygous recessive, which is little g, little g. Then I can use this other Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared is equal to 1. So P squared is the homozygous dominant frequency, the frequency of big G, big G in this case. 2PQ is the heterozygous frequency, so big G, little g frequency in this case. Q squared is the homozygous recessive frequency, so little g, little g frequency in this case. Let's plug those previous P and Q values in. P squared would then be 0.36. 2PQ would be 0.48. Q squared equals 0.16. Cool, huh? The only thing is that when calculating Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium problems, you don't always have the P and Q values. So we're going to do an example. New population of frogs, so forget the previous frequencies. This is a new frog population in a new frog land. But we'll still use the same allele letters. So here's the information you get for this new population. Population. There are 500 frogs, and of those, 375 frogs are dark green. The rest are light green. With that information, please solve all genotype frequencies and all allele frequencies if in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Step one, determine first whether you're going to work with the first equation or the second equation. Since I'm working with individuals here that have genotypes, I'm going to work with the second equation first. Step two, figure out what value you can determine. So 375 frogs are dark green out of 500 total. That would mean 125 frogs are light green since there are 500 frogs total. But I can't use whole numbers like that as both of these equations ultimately are equal to 1. I need frequencies for these equations. Now I could say 375 dark green frogs out of 500 total frogs is 0.75, but all I know is that would be the frequency of dark green frogs. The problem is dark green frogs could have genotype big G, big G, or they could have big G, little g. I can't assume they're one genotype or the other, so I shouldn't use that value. The recessive genotype resulting in a light green trait is safe to use though, because because I know that light green frogs are the genotype little g, little g. They can't be anything else. So 125 frogs out of 500 frogs equals 0.25. That means from the equation, the value q squared equals 0.25. Step three, take a value you solved from the previous step and calculate from there. So if I know that q squared is 0.25, then I could go ahead and solve for q. If q squared is 0.25, I can determine q if I take the square root of 0.25. Therefore, q is equal to 0.5. That's the allele frequency for the recessive allele little g. If I know the q value, I can find out the p value using the first equation. 
Since P plus Q is equal to 1, now I know that P is equal to 0.5. That's the allele frequency for the dominant allele, big G. Now I have P, and I have Q, and I can take care of everything else. I can use the second equation to determine the homozygous dominant frequency, the heterozygous frequency, and I already knew the homozygous recessive frequency from the beginning. Plugging those in, P squared equals 0.25 for the genotype frequency, big G, big G. 2PQ equals 0.5 for the genotype frequency, big G, little g. Q squared equals 0.25 for the genotype frequency, little g, little g. By studying allele and genotype frequencies, population genetics helps us understand how genetic variations contribute to the diversity of populations and how evolution shapes these populations over time. In theory, if a population is in equilibrium with no evolutionary forces at play, its gene pool and genetic structure would remain constant from generation to generation. In reality, though, natural populations are constantly evolving due to various factors like drift, mutation, migration, and selection. While the exact distribution of phenotypes can only be determined through direct observation, the Hardy-Weinberg principle provides a mathematical reference point of a non-evolving population against which evolving populations can be compared. Deviations from the expected frequencies of alleles or genotypes indicate evolutionary changes. That figure 19.2 is showing that when populations are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, the allelic frequency is stable from generation to generation, and we can determine the allele distribution from the Hardy-Weinberg equations. If the allelic frequency measured in the field differs from the predicted value, then scientists can make inferences about what evolutionary forces are at play. Heritability refers to the portion of variation in phenotypes that can be attributed to genetic differences among individuals in a population. When a population exhibits high heritability, it means that genetic variation strongly influences the traits and makes them more susceptible to evolutionary forces. Genetic variance, which encompasses the diversity of alleles and genotypes within a population, is important when it comes to breeding programs for species preservation. In these programs, scientists aim to maintain high genetic variance to preserve the diversity of traits. This approach also helps minimize the risks associated with inbreeding, where closely related individuals mate and bring together harmful recessive mutations that can lead to abnormalities and disease susceptibility. For instance, rare recessive alleles causing diseases may persist in a population at low levels since the chance of carriers mating and producing affected offspring are low. However, when carriers interbreed, the likelihood of disease inheritance increases, resulting in a phenomenon known Known as inbreeding depression. As natural selection acts on a population, it weeds out genes that have advantageous effects. But it can only weed out these genes if they are actually expressed in an individual. For dominant gene versions, that's no problem. Individuals carrying dominant genes with a detrimental effect will be selected against, and eventually these genes will be purged from the population. For recessive gene versions, however, the story is a bit different. Recessive genes are only expressed when an individual carries two copies of them. Once natural selection has removed most of the detrimental recessive genes from a population, these seldomly wind up paired with an identical copy and are effectively hidden from the effects of natural selection. This means that most populations carry many deleterious recessive gene versions that are very rarely expressed, except in cases of inbreeding. Closely related individuals are likely to carry the same deleterious recessive gene versions and pass two copies of that gene onto their offspring. Genetic drift, influenced by chance events, causes fluctuation in allele and genotype frequencies within a population. Certain individuals may have more offspring due to being at the right place and time, leading to an increase in frequency for certain genes. Factors like camouflage or drought resistance exert selective pressures as well. Gene flow, the movement of alleles through migration, plays a significant role in evolution because populations experience fluctuations as individuals disperse and introduce new genetic variation in different locations and habitats. Mutations drive population diversity. Harmful mutations are eliminated by natural selection while beneficial mutations spread. Some mutations have significant effects on genes and phenotypes while others persist naturally. Natural disasters and Amplified genetic drift's impact through the bottleneck effect, wiping out a portion of the gene pool. The surviving genetic makeup defines the entire population, causing differences from pre-disaster populations.
species. The founder effect occurs when a subset establishes a new population aligning the genetic composition with the founding individuals. The Afrikaner population in South Africa is a good example of the founder effect. Uh, the genetic history of Afrikaners shows a high prevalence of certain mutations compared to other populations, likely due to a higher occurrence of these mutations among the founding colonists. Consequently, the population has a higher incidence of genetic disorders, such as Huntington's disease and Fanconi anemia, which can lead to various health complications, including blood marrow abnormalities and cancer. Figure 19.4 shows how genetic drift in a population can lead to eliminating an allele from a population by chance. In this example, rabbits with brown coat color allele big B are dominant over rabbits with white coat color allele little b. In the first generation, the two alleles occur with equal frequency in the population, resulting in a P and Q value of 0.5 each. Only half the individuals reproduce, resulting in a second generation with P and Q values of 0.7 and 0.3, respectively. Only two individuals in the second generation reproduce, and by chance, these individuals are homozygous dominant for brown coat color. As a result, in the third generation, the recessive little b allele is lost. Small populations are more vulnerable to genetic drift, while large populations are more resilient to chance events. For instance, if individuals, if an individual out of a group of 10 dies before producing any offspring, their genes, which make up one-tenth of the gene pool, will be lost. However, in a population of 100, the loss would only amount to 1% of the overall gene pool, making it less significant in terms of genetic structure. The bottleneck effect happens when the population number is dramatically decreased as a result of natural disasters such as earthquakes, floods, and other types of natural disasters. The new population is made up of the organisms that were able to survive the disaster, and the new population's allele frequency will be radically different from the original allele frequency. Uh, let me show you this very short video that's a very good demonstration of how the bottleneck effect works. The founder effect occurs when a small group of individuals from a larger population establishes a new population in a different location. When a physical barrier isolates a subset of the population, the genetic composition of the new population reflects that of the founding members, the founding individuals, which may differ from the original population. This can lead to higher frequencies of certain alleles and genetic traits in the new population, including rare or harmful mutations. As a result, the new population, including these rare or harmful mutations, may experience higher incidence of certain genetic disorders or unique genetic characteristics compared to the original population. Non-random mating also plays a role in population genetics. So mate choice, such as female peahens refer preferring peacocks with larger, more vibrant tails, can lead to selective breeding. Assorted of mating, where individuals prefer to mate with partners who resemble them phenotypically, is another form of non-random mating. Physical location can also influence mating patterns, particularly in large populations scattered across vast areas where individuals may have limited access to each other due to geographic barriers or distance. The environment is another factor that contributes to population variation. Environmental conditions can impact phenotypes such as darker skin in individuals exposed to sunlight regularly. In some species, the environment even determines major characteristics like sex as seen in turtles and reptiles with temperature-dependent sex determination. Geographic separation between populations can result in phenotypic differences observed in various variations along ecological gradients known as clines. A cline is a gradual continuous variation in characteristic or trait of a population across a geographic range or environmental gradient. Clines typically result from the influence of environmental factors on the expression of genes within a population. As individuals move or across different geographic regions or encounter varying environmental conditions, their traits may change gradually and predictably. Clines are often observed in response to factors such as temperature, altitude, or other ecological gradients, and they provide valuable insights into how populations adapt and evolve in different environments. For example, warm-blooded animals tend to have larger bodies in cooler climates closer to the poles, enabling better heat conservation, while flowering plants, on the other hand, bloom at different times along mountain slopes. Natural selection shapes the population's traits by favoring beneficial alleles that enhance survival and reproduction. So while discouraging harmful 
alleles. And this process is known as adaptive evolution, and it acts on entire organisms rather than individual alleles. For instance, and it may possess a genotype that promotes high reproductive ability, but also carries alleles that carry fatal childhood disease. In such cases, natural selection operates at the individual level, favoring these individuals that contribute more to the gene pool of the next generation. This concept of an organism's evolutionary fitness quantifies its reproductive success relative to other members of the population. Scientists employ various approaches to study how selection influences population variation, including stabilizing selection, directional selection, diversifying selection, diversifying selection, frequency-dependent selection, and sexual selection. Each of these modes of selection can impact the genetic diversity within a population, making individuals more or less similar and influencing the range of phenotypes observed. Stabilizing selection occurs when natural selection favors an average phenotype and is against extreme variations. For instance, in a population of forest-dwelling mice, individuals with fur color closely matching the forest floor have a higher chance of survival as they blend in better and they're less likely to be detected by predators. Mice with lighter or darker fur will stand out and become more vulnerable to predation. Over time, the stabilizing selection will reduce the genetic variance within the population. Directional selection occurs when environmental changes favor phenotypes at one end of the existing variation spectrum. An iconic example of this is peppered moths during the Industrial Revolution. Originally, light-colored moths blended in with the trees better, but as pollution darkened the trees, birds preyed more easily on the lighter moths, and then the darker moths increased due to their superior, superior camouflage. If the forest floor experienced a color change, a hypothetical population of mice might evolve different colors to adapt to that as well. In such cases, directional selection is shifting the genetic variance of the population towards the new advantageous phenotype. Sometimes natural selection favors multiple distinct phenotypes, while intermediate ones are less advantageous on average. Scientists call this diversifying selection. An example of diversifying selection can be seen in animal populations with different male forms. Dominant alpha males use their strength to secure mates, while smaller males employ sneaky tactics to mate with females. In an alpha male's territory, both alpha and sneaking males are selected for, while medium-sized males who can't outcompete are too big for sneaking and they face selection against them. Diversifying selection can also occur when environmental change favors individuals on opposite ends of the phenotypic spectrum. Imagine a mouse population living at a beach with light-colored sand and patches of tall grass. Light-colored mice will blend in with the sand. Dark-colored mice will be able to hide in the grass, while medium-colored mice wouldn't blend very well with the sand or the grass. This type of selection increases genetic variance and promotes population diversity. Another type of selection called frequency-dependent selection favors phenotypes that are either common or rare. So an interesting example of frequency-dependent selection is observed in Pacific Northwest lizards. Male common side botch lizards exhibit three throat-colored patterns, orange, blue, and yellow. Each pattern corresponds to a different reproductive strategy. The orange males are strong and they fight for females. Blue males form strong pair bonds, and yellow males resemble females in order to sneak copulations. Like a game of rock, paper, scissors, orange beats blue, blue beats yellow, and yellow beats orange in the competition for mates. Thus, selection favors orange males when blue dominates the population, blue males when yellow dominates, and yellow males when orange dominates. This cycle of selection results in varying distributions of these phenotypes over generations. Sexual dimorphisms, where males and females of a species differ beyond just their reproductive organs, are common in many populations. Males often possess larger sizes and elaborate adornments, while females often are smaller and less decorated. These differences arise when there is greater variation in male reproductive success. Some males, typically bigger and more adorned, secure the majority of matings, while others are unsuccessful. 
And this can be due to male's fighting ability or female's preference for certain traits. And such variation generates strong selection pressure among males, leading to the evolution of larger body sizes and elaborate ornaments to attract female attention. Females with a smaller number of chosen matings have a greater tendency to select desirable males. Sexual dimorphism varies among species, and some species exhibit reversed sex roles where the females have greater reproductive success variants and are selected for larger sizes and elaborate traits typically associated with males. There are three categories of natural selection. Directional selection, where one extreme is favored, stabilizing selection, where an intermediate is favored, and diversifying selection, where both extremes are favored simultaneously. These can be a bit difficult to envision, so we're now going to go over an example and a graph for each one. You might see graphs like this on various standardized tests. They're very popular on exams like the AP, the IB, the A-level, etc. They can sometimes have different colors or orientations, but the most important thing is to remember that one line usually shows what a population used to look like, and the other line shows what the population looked like later on. In this video, the black line shows the starting population, and the green line shows what it comes to look like after being put under pressure from certain conditions. In directional selection, one extreme phenotype is favored rather than an intermediate. Directional selection can be a subtle shift, or it can occur more dramatically, as in the famous case of the peppered moths. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, a population of light-colored moths inhabited the city of Manchester in the UK. These moths blended in beautifully against the neutral-colored tree bark in buildings. Darker-colored moths were virtually unknown, as they were so easy for predators to see. However, by the year 1848, the moth population had almost entirely changed color. Dark-colored moths were now the norm, and light-colored moths were more rare. Why? The city of Manchester rapidly became industrialized right around that time. The new coal-burning factories covered the city with dark, greasy soot. With the new, darker habitat, predators could easily spot the light-colored moths, and any moths born with the dark color mutation were much more likely to survive long enough to reproduce. Over time, the population shifted from nearly all light-colored moths to nearly all dark moths. Other examples of directional selection include Darwin's famous population of finches, who were more likely to survive if their beaks were better suited to the food that was most readily available. In stabilizing selection, an intermediate phenotype is favored rather than one or both extremes. A great example is a peacock tail. Male peacocks are famous for their enormous colorful tails, which they use to attract female peacocks. Usually, females prefer the males with the largest and most highly colorful tails because they signal that the male is healthy and probably has good genes. Based on this, we might assume that the goal is to have as large of a tail as possible. However, in addition to attracting all the ladies, enormous tails have a couple of significant drawbacks. Males with exceptionally large tails are much more likely to be eaten before they have a chance to pass on their genes. The best of both worlds is to have a tail that is large enough to attract a mate, but not so large as to prevent you from flying. Male peacocks actually can fold up their tails and fly, but not very far. Other examples of stabilizing selection include birth weight in humans and stem height in plants. In both cases, the intermediate is favored. In diversifying selection, both extremes are selected for simultaneously, while the intermediate is selected against. Diversifying selection is much more rare relative to directional and stabilizing selection. If you think about it, it's pretty rare to have two extreme phenotypes that are equally useful at the same time, but it does happen. Rock pocket mice are an excellent example of diversifying selection. Much of the southwestern U.S. is made up of hot, dry desert climate with light-colored sand. The mice tend to have light-colored coats, and it allows them to hide from predators. However, in an area called the Valley of Fires in New Mexico, the light sand is suddenly punctuated by a large area of dark rock. This area is known as the El Malpais lava flow. Scientists believe that it is from a volcanic eruption that occurred roughly 5,000 years ago. In the area surrounding the lava flow, dark-colored rock pocket mice can also be found. Prior to the lava flow, any rock pocket mouse born in the desert with a dark coat as a result of random mutation likely would not survive long enough to reproduce. It would stand out against the light-colored sand and would be an easy target for predators. When the lava flow suddenly added areas of darker habitats, dark-colored mice suddenly were better able to survive. Today, across the Valley of the Fires region, we can now find both light and dark-colored mice. But what about intermediately colored mice? A mouse with an intermediate coat would not be well suited to either the light sandy environment or the dark rocky environment. Because it would struggle to hide from predators, it would likely not survive long enough to reproduce. Because both the light and dark extremes are favored, our final population graph would look like this. Sometimes sexual selection is so intense that it favors traits that are actually detrimental to survival. Take the peacock's tail, for example. It's stunning, and the males with the largest, most colorful tail is most likely to attract a mate. However, it's not very practical, and it makes males more visible to predators and hampers their escape ability. There's evidence suggesting that females prefer big tails because they indicate a male's ability to survive with such a risk. The bigger the tail, the fitter the male. This 
is known as the handicap principle. The handicap principle suggests certain traits or behaviors in individuals can serve as honest signals of their genetic fitness or overall quality. According to this principle, individuals with more pronounced or extravagant traits, which may appear detrimental or costly, demonstrate their ability to survive and reproduce despite these drawbacks. These traits act as handicaps that put individuals at a disadvantage in survival, but they also demonstrate their genetic superiority and resilience. According to the good genes hypothesis, males develop impressive ornaments to showcase their efficient metabolism or their disease-fighting abilities. Females then choose males with these traits as it signals their genetic superiority, which would be passed on to their offspring. While some may argue that females shouldn't be picky to maximize their number of offspring, choosing better males can be beneficial. Having fewer but healthier offspring can increase their chances of survival more than having many weaker offspring. It's important to note that evolution doesn't have a predetermined goal. It's the accumulation of various forces influencing the population's genetic and phenotypic variation. Natural selection cannot produce a perfect organism. It can only make the best with what it has. It only works with existing genetic variation in a population and the new alleles that arise through mutation and gene flow. Natural selection can be constrained by relationships between different polymorphisms, and other forces like genetic drift and gene flow can introduce deleterious alleles to the gene pool, working against adaptation. Natural selection operates at the individual level, considering the net effect of alleles on an organism's fitness. Some alleles may be beneficial, others may be unfavorable, and their collective impact determines natural selection's influence. This means that good alleles can be lost if individuals carrying them also have overwhelmingly bad alleles. And bad alleles can be retained in a population if individuals with overall fitness benefits possess them. This concludes the Lesson 8 material. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments below.